once upon a time on the shores of the Sea of Galilee in a bustling fishing village called Bethsaida, which was home to both Jews and Gentiles, a man destined for a life of obscurity and anonymity was born. His birth name was Simon, son of Jonah. The calm waters of Galilee were the backdrop of his humble beginnings, a Roman outpost witnessing the daily struggles of fishermen. In this remote place, Simon's story began to unfold. His life followed its course, until around the year 30, a decisive encounter would completely transform his trajectory. A man named Jesus crossed his path, bringing with him a message that would leave an indelible mark on Simon. The simple fisherman found something worth more than any treasure, a greater purpose that would change his life forever. But before becoming the Peter we know, Simon was just a son of humble peasant parents named Jonah and his wife. Like most Jewish babies of the time, his life expectations were modest, destined for labor in the fields and the struggle for subsistence under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. In this modest beginning, it was hard to imagine the transformative role that this man who would later be called Peter would play in the history of mankind. The year was about one before Christ, when Simon came into the world, immersed in a turbulent political and religious setting. This context would deeply shape the character and trajectory of his life. Simon was not a gentle spirit. He grew up in a culture dominated by fishing and trade, which forged his robust and assertive personality from an early age. These characteristics were necessary to survive in a world full of challenges. As a boy, Simon saw his father, Jonah, start an informal fishing partnership with Zebedee, a relative of the woman who would later become his wife. Zebedee was also the father of Simon's close friend, John, who would become another notable disciple of Jesus. This family and professional relationship reveals the complex web of connections that involved the fishing community in Bethsaida. The fishing industry at the time was not a mere small-scale operation, but an activity of great importance under Roman rule. Men like Simon, who had control over fishing and were taxed by the empire, were often viewed with suspicion and considered undesirable. Around the age of 25, Simon took an important step in his life, marrying a woman from his hometown. To meet the demands of the Roman fishing industry, he and his wife moved to Capernaum, a vibrant and bustling port. It was in this city, around 27 after Christ, that Simon, his brother Andrew, and his in-laws first came into contact with the revolutionary teachings of John the Baptist on the banks of the Jordan River. Simon, like many who heard John the Baptist, was intrigued by his message, but his responsibilities as a fisherman did not allow him to be easily swayed by a message that seemed to focus mainly on life after death. For Simon, the more pressing reality was the present, the struggle for survival amidst harsh Roman oppression. His mind was occupied with earthly concerns, while his brother Andrew was deeply touched by John's message and promptly joined the movement, leaving Simon and others in charge of the fishing business. At that time, Simon had no idea that his lukewarm attitude towards God and religion was about to undergo a radical transformation. The turning point in his life came with the arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. The day everything changed happened in Nazareth. While Andrew followed John and witnessed the baptism of Jesus in the waters, he heard words that would echo in his mind forever. Jesus was baptized by John and proclaimed as the Lamb of God. Andrew was astonished, perhaps recalling Genesis 22, where God's provision is clearly revealed in the story of the binding of Isaac. In that passage, Isaac asked his father Abraham about the lamb for the burnt offering, to which Abraham replied that God himself would provide the lamb for the sacrifice. Now, before the eyes of the world, John the Baptist, one of God's major prophets, was declaring that this simple man, Jesus, was the Lamb of God. No wonder Andrew was surprised. He followed Jesus for a while and absorbed his teachings. With each word heard, Andrew became convinced that John the Baptist was on the right path, but soon realized that Jesus was taking him even further. With determination, he persuaded his brother Simon to meet Jesus. 
At first, Simon was skeptical. He was not ready to accept without question. But it didn't take long for Jesus' divine authority to manifest itself in an undeniable way. One day, when Jesus met Simon, he found him discouraged and dejected on the deck of his fishing boat. After hours of effort at sea, Simon was about to return home empty-handed, his fishing net empty and frustration mounting. Luke described what happened next with great eloquence. Jesus finished speaking and said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon, perhaps with a mix of discouragement and curiosity, replied, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And then something extraordinary happened. When the nets hit the water, they filled with fish in such an astonishing quantity that the nets began to break. Simon and his companions, incredulous at the abundant catch, quickly called their partners in the other boat to help them. Together, they filled both boats so much that they nearly sank in the water. Astonishment took over everyone. Simon Peter, seeing this miracle before his eyes, fell to his knees before Jesus and uttered words that would echo in his heart for the rest of his life. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. It was a moment of profound revelation when the divine presence manifested in an unquestionable way. All those present were amazed at the extraordinary catch and at the man who had triggered it. This episode, recorded in the book of Luke chapter 5, marked the beginning of a spiritual journey that would forever transform Simon into Peter, the unwavering apostle. It wasn't just Simon who recognized Jesus' authority in that first encounter. Jesus also discerned Simon's inner strength. He invited Simon to follow him, promising to make him a fisher of men. Any hesitation Simon might have felt disappeared at that moment. He left his fishing net and decided to follow the Messiah. Shortly after, Jesus made a significant pronouncement about his vision for Simon. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples what people were saying about him. The answers varied, some comparing him to John the Baptist, others to Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. However, the most important question was, but who do you say I am? Then Simon Peter, with conviction, answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Simon Peter's words resonated deeply. Jesus recognized the divine revelation behind Simon's statement and blessed him. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16 verses 13 to 20. This incident marked Simon's now called Peter rise to a position of leadership and prominence. However, the journey ahead would not be simple or easy. It would be filled with challenges and adversities that would require Peter's utmost perseverance. But with his unwavering faith and the divine promise in his heart, he was prepared to face any obstacle in the name of the message that he now recognized as the most precious of all. Peter's transformation was profound. When he left behind his fishing business, his family, and the security he knew to follow Jesus, he was aligning himself with a new revolution. This revolution would not only challenge the oppressive Roman regime, but also question the rigid traditions of the Sanhedrin, the Orthodox Council of the time. Peter witnessed and participated in countless miracles alongside Jesus. From the wedding at Cana, where water turned into wine, to the healing of his mother-in-law, these events solidified his belief in Jesus as the Messiah. However, Peter's journey was not without trials and doubts. The first major test came during a storm on the Sea of Galilee. After the miracle of Jesus feeding the multitude of 5,000 people, he sent Peter and the other disciples ahead in a boat while he stayed behind to pray. Later in the night, the disciples faced a terrible storm on the Sea of Galilee. Battling fierce winds and choppy waves, they encountered a figure walking towards them on the water. Terror enveloped them. 
and they believed it was a ghost. Sensitive to their fear, Jesus immediately reassured them, saying, Do not be afraid. It was then that Peter boldly asked Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus complied with his request, inviting him to walk on the water. Peter, with faith and courage, stepped out of the boat and began walking towards Jesus on the water. However, in the midst of his walk, Peter noticed the strong wind around him, and fear quickly overtook him. He began to sink into the water and cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me. At this critical moment, Jesus extended his hand and held Peter, rescuing him. It was then that he uttered the famous words, You of little faith, why did you doubt? After this incident, they returned to the boat, and the wind ceased. For Peter, this experience was a crucial lesson on faith and trust, a reminder that even in the most challenging situations, faith in Jesus could overcome fear and uncertainty. This experience further strengthened his commitment to the mission he and Jesus were destined to fulfill. Another crucial moment in Peter's journey with Jesus was the experience of the Transfiguration. One day, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to a high mountain, often identified by historians as Mount Tabor. While on the mountain, something extraordinary happened. Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. This symbolized the union of the law, represented by Moses and the prophets, represented by Elijah, bearing witness to Jesus as the promised Messiah. Peter, often impulsive, reacted immediately, offering to build three shelters or tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down. Then Jesus approached them, touched them, and told them not to be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. He instructed them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after he had risen from the dead. There were several reasons for this instruction, but the main one was that Jesus had not yet finished preparing the disciples for what would come after the resurrection. Despite the profound experiences they shared, Peter's understanding of Jesus' mission was constantly evolving. He struggled to reconcile his expectations of a liberating Messiah with the prophecies of suffering and death that Jesus had also foretold. The transfiguration was a moment of divine revelation, but also a reminder that Peter's journey was far from over, and he had much to learn about the true nature of the kingdom Jesus was establishing. Towards the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus began explaining to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. He said that he would be killed and rise on the third day. Peter, surprised by this statement, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Then Jesus turned to Peter and firmly rebuked him, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. It's important to note that Jesus was not calling Peter Satan, but was rebuking the spirit behind Peter's words. Peter's reaction, though driven by love and concern for Jesus, was based on a misunderstanding of Jesus' mission and the nature of his kingdom. The climax of Peter's discipleship occurred during the Last Supper, the final meal Jesus shared with his twelve disciples. Jesus announced that one of them would betray him, causing discomfort and questioning among the disciples. Peter felt the need to affirm his unwavering loyalty to Jesus, declaring that he would never betray or deny him, even if it meant death for him. In response, Jesus told Peter that before the rooster crowed the next morning, he would deny him three times. Shortly after Jesus' arrest, an incident occurred in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was praying after the Last Supper when Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, arrived with a group of soldiers and officials from the chief priests and Pharisees to arrest Jesus. 
Peter, giving in to his impulsiveness, drew a sword and struck Malchus, the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Jesus immediately rebuked Peter, ordering him to put away the sword, and uttered the profoundly revealing statement, All who draw the sword will die by the sword. Then, Jesus touched Malchus's ear, demonstrating his commitment to non-violence and compassion even at the moment of his arrest. This episode marked a critical point in Peter's journey, where he began to understand more fully the principles of the kingdom Jesus was establishing and to renounce violence as a means of achieving God's purpose. Even in the face of Jesus' betrayal and arrest that same night, Peter and other disciples followed Jesus at a distance as he was taken to the high priest's house for trial. While in the high priest's courtyard, a servant girl recognized Peter as one of Jesus' followers and pointed him out. Peter, however, denied knowing Jesus, responding that he did not know him. This happened on two more occasions, and on each, Peter gave similar responses. After the third denial, a rooster crowed, fulfilling the prediction Jesus had made during the Last Supper. This realization hit Peter deeply, making him remember Jesus' words. Consumed by guilt and sorrow, Peter left the place, weeping bitterly. We do not know exactly where Peter was when Jesus was on the cross, as the Gospels do not mention him again until after Jesus' resurrection. This suggests that, like most of the other disciples, Peter might have hidden for fear of being arrested or persecuted due to his association with Jesus. Although it may seem cowardly, it's important to remember that this period was marked by extreme fear, confusion, and despair for the disciples, who were struggling to understand the arrest and crucifixion of their leader. Three days after the crucifixion of Jesus, Mary Magdalene and other women went to the tomb early in the morning to anoint his body. However, upon their arrival, they found the stone at the entrance of the tomb removed and the body of Jesus missing. Later, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and instructed her to tell the disciples about his resurrection, marking the beginning of a new phase in the journey of Peter and the other followers of Jesus. Mary did as she was instructed and shared the news of Jesus' resurrection. Peter, accompanied by John, ran to the tomb to see with their own eyes, and indeed, Jesus was no longer there. Later, Jesus appeared to the disciples on several occasions, including a significant encounter that occurred near the Sea of Galilee. In this encounter, Peter and several other disciples were fishing at night, but had caught nothing. At dawn they saw Jesus on the shore, but at first did not recognize him. Then Jesus instructed them to cast the net on the right side of the boat, which resulted in a large catch of fish. It was at this moment that John recognized Jesus and said to Peter, It is the Lord. Upon hearing this, Peter, with his characteristic impulsiveness, wrapped himself in his outer garment and jumped into the water to swim to the shore. The other disciples followed in the boat. Once on the shore, they found Jesus preparing a fire with coals, fish, and some bread. Jesus invited them to bring some of the fish they had just caught, and after they had finished eating, he had a significant conversation with Peter. Jesus asked Peter three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Each time Peter affirmed his love for Jesus. In response, Jesus gave Peter a command. Feed my lambs, then take care of my sheep, and finally feed my sheep. This conversation highlighted Peter's forgiveness and restoration, setting the stage for the leadership role he would play in the early Christian church after Jesus' resurrection. Peter thus received the mission to care for Christ's flock of followers and to lead the church in its growth and spread. During a period of 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, including Peter. In one of these appearances, he gathered them and gave his final instructions. Jesus asked them to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. He commissioned them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After giving these instructions, Peter and the other disciples watched in awe 
as Jesus was lifted up into heaven before their eyes. A cloud hid him from their view as he ascended into heaven. As they were looking into the sky, two angels dressed in white appeared beside them and asked the men of Galilee why they were standing there looking into the sky. They explained that the same Jesus who had been taken up into heaven would return in the same way they had seen him go into heaven. Following Jesus' instructions, Peter and the other disciples returned from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. There they gathered in an upper room, where they were united in prayer and preparation, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. In a momentous event, the Holy Spirit descended upon them like a strong wind, filling the house where they were, and what appeared to be tongues of fire rested on each of them. All were filled with the Holy Spirit, enabling them to speak in different languages. Peter then stood up before the believers and delivered a powerful sermon. He explained that what they were witnessing was the fulfillment of God's promises and prophecies. Peter spoke of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, declaring Him as Lord and Christ. That day, about 3,000 people accepted his message and were baptized. This marked the birth of the first Christians and the beginning of the early Christian church, with Peter playing a central role as leader and preacher. After Jesus' ascension, the role of leader and nurturer of the early church fell to Peter, despite his many stumbles. Peter firmly assumed his leadership and commitment to spreading the message of salvation entrusted to him by Jesus. One of Peter's first acts of leadership was to fill the vacancy left by Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus and committed suicide. As reported in Acts chapter 1, verses 13 to 26, Peter led the selection of Matthias as the twelfth apostle. Early in his ministry in the early church, Peter performed a notable miracle at the temple, known as the Miracle at the Beautiful Gate. According to Acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 10, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray when they encountered a man lame from birth who was being carried to the beautiful gate. He begged for alms from those passing by. Instead of giving money, Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Peter then took the man by the hand and helped him up. Immediately the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped up, began to walk, and entered the temple courts, walking, jumping, and praising God. This miracle caused great astonishment among the people in the temple area, and provided Peter with the opportunity to preach about Jesus Christ and his resurrection at Solomon's colonnade. Upon hearing the teachings of Peter and John, the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees were deeply disturbed. Peter and John were arrested and held in prison until the next day, as it was already evening. The next day, Peter and John were brought for interrogation before the high priest regarding their actions, with a specific focus on wanting to know by what authority or in whose name they had healed the lame man who was now filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter faced the Sanhedrin boldly and declared that the healing was done in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom they themselves had crucified, but whom God had raised from the dead. Peter emphasized that salvation could be found in no one else but Jesus. These words were not well received by the Sanhedrin, but they found themselves in a difficult position. The miracle was undeniable, and the crowd had witnessed it. Therefore, the Sanhedrin decided to order Peter and John not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. However, the fearless response of Peter and John was that they would obey God rather than human beings and could not help but speak about what they had seen and heard. Faced with new threats from the Sanhedrin, they eventually released Peter and John, as they could not reach a consensus on what punishment to impose. The presence of the crowd, who had witnessed the miracle, undoubtedly influenced this decision. Peter played a central role in the decision-making, teaching, and administration of the early church. One notable episode involved Ananias and Sapphira, a couple from the early Christian community, as reported in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Ananias and Sapphira sold a property, 
but instead of contributing the full sale amount to the community, as was the custom among believers, they conspired to keep part of the money while pretending to donate the entire amount. Ananias presented part of the money to the apostles, but Peter, guided by divine revelation, confronted him about the reason for lying to the Holy Spirit and withholding part of the money. Peter explained that while the property was theirs, they were not obliged to sell it or donate the profit, but their deception was not against humans, but against God. Upon hearing Peter's words, Ananias abruptly fell dead. About three hours later, without knowing what had happened to her husband, Sapphira arrived and was questioned by Peter about the amount of money. She had the opportunity to be truthful but chose to tell the same lie. Peter then told her that she too had tested the Spirit of the Lord and that the men who had buried her husband were at the door, ready to carry her out. Sapphira fell at Peter's feet and died. She was buried beside her husband. These events caused great fear throughout the church and among all who heard of what had happened. It was a striking reminder of the seriousness of lying and the need for sincerity and integrity in the early Christian community. Peter played a central role in this episode, demonstrating the importance of honesty and integrity in following Christ. After attracting the attention of the Jewish leadership again, Peter and the apostles faced persecution. The high priest ordered the arrest of Peter and the other apostles, intending to put them on trial. However, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison and instructed the apostles to go to the temple and continue teaching. The apostles followed this guidance. When the high priest and his associates convened the Sanhedrin and sent for the apostles in prison, they discovered that the apostles had disappeared. Later, they found the apostles teaching in the temple. The apostles were brought back for interrogation, and the high priest reminded them of the previous orders not to teach in the name of Jesus. Peter and the apostles responded that they must obey God rather than human beings. The Sanhedrin was furious and planned to kill them on the spot. However, Gamaliel, a respected Pharisee and teacher of the law, advised caution. He suggested that if the work of the apostles was from God, it could not be stopped. The Sanhedrin followed Gamaliel's advice and released the apostles after flogging them. Peter and the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing and considered themselves worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. They continued to teach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, demonstrating courage and determination in the face of persecution. Soon after, Peter had a strange encounter with a sorcerer named Simon in Samaria. Simon was a magician who had amazed the people with his magic tricks. However, when Philip preached the gospel in Samaria, Simon also converted and was baptized. When Peter and John arrived in Samaria, they prayed for the new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The believers received the Holy Spirit, and Simon, witnessing this, offered money to the apostles. He wanted to buy the power to lay hands on others, so that they too could receive the Holy Spirit. Peter severely rebuked Simon, telling him that his heart was not right before God, and that he could not buy God's gift with money. This rebuke highlighted the importance of sincerity and a pure heart in seeking the Holy Spirit and accepting the gospel. Peter was about to face another major test that would have significant implications for all Gentiles. In Caesarea, a centurion named Cornelius, a devout man, had a vision in which an angel told him to send messengers to Joppa and call for Peter, who was staying at the house of Simon the Tanner. While Cornelius's messengers were on their way, Peter had a vision. In Peter's vision, the heavens opened, and a large sheet came down to earth, containing all kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds, some of which were considered unclean according to Jewish tradition. A voice told Peter to kill and eat these animals. Peter, as an observant Jew, objected, arguing that he had never eaten anything impure in his life. However, the voice told him not to consider unclean what God had made clean. This happened three times, and then the sheet was taken back into heaven. 
As Peter pondered the vision, the spirit told him that Cornelius's messengers were looking for him and that he should go with them without hesitation. Peter met Cornelius's messengers and went with them to Cornelius's house in Caesarea. There, Cornelius had gathered relatives and close friends to hear what Peter had to say. Peter explained that it was against Jewish tradition to associate with Gentiles, but God had shown him that he should not consider anyone impure or unclean. Peter shared the gospel with them, speaking of the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Peter spoke, the Holy Spirit descended on all who heard the message, including the Gentiles. The Jewish believers who were with Peter were amazed to see that the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Peter then ordered that Cornelius and his family be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, marking a significant moment in the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles. Persecution against the members of the early church continued, and this time, Peter was facing imprisonment again. King Herod Agrippa, also known as Herod I, began to persecute members of the church. He executed James, the brother of John, which pleased the Jewish leaders. Herod then proceeded to arrest Peter during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Peter was guarded by four squads of four soldiers each, and the intention was to bring him to trial after Passover. Seeing that their leader, Peter, was imprisoned, the church began to pray fervently for him on the night before Herod's planned trial. While Peter was sleeping between the soldiers, chained with two chains, an angel of the Lord appeared in the cell. A light shone in the darkness, and the angel woke Peter, instructing him to get up quickly. As Peter got up, the chains fell off his wrists. The angel then ordered Peter to dress and follow him. Peter thought he was having a vision and did not realize what was actually happening. They passed the guards and reached the iron gate leading to the city, which opened for them by itself. They went down one street and then the angel left him. When Peter realized he was free, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people were gathered and praying. Herod, upon discovering that Peter had miraculously escaped, ordered the execution of the guards who had been in charge of watching him. Moreover, there were significant debates in the early church about whether Gentile converts to Christianity needed to follow Jewish law, including circumcision. The Council of Jerusalem brought together key figures, including Peter, Paul, Barnabas and James, to discuss this issue. Peter reminded the assembly how God chose him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, highlighting that God knew the hearts of the Gentile believers and showed his acceptance by giving them the Holy Spirit. Peter argued against imposing the yoke of the Mosaic law on the Gentiles, noting that neither Jewish ancestors nor Jewish believers were able to fulfill this law. This decision, known as the Council of Jerusalem, was fundamental in establishing that salvation came through faith in Jesus Christ, regardless of strict observance of Jewish law, and opened the way for ministry among the Gentiles. Peter played a fundamental role in the Council of Jerusalem, where he affirmed the belief that both Jews and Gentiles are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. His speech had a significant influence on the Council's decision, which agreed not to burden Gentile believers with Jewish customs, such as circumcision or full observance of the Mosaic Law. After the Council of Jerusalem, Peter continued to travel, preach, and spread the Christian faith. Although the specific details of his travels are not fully documented, some sources suggest that he may have ministered in various regions, including Asia Minor. Additionally, Peter wrote epistles that are part of the New Testament. The first epistle of Peter is addressed to the exiles scattered through various regions. In this epistle, Peter offers encouragement and guidance to Christians facing persecution. He emphasizes themes such as hope, the endurance of God's word, and the importance of living a holy life even amidst trials. In the second epistle of Peter, the author warns against the influence of false teachers and encourages believers to grow in their faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
Furthermore, he emphasizes the certainty of Christ's return and the importance of living a godly life. Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus, was martyred in Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero around the year 64 AD. According to Christian tradition, he was crucified upside down at his own request, feeling unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. It is widely accepted that Peter was buried on Vatican Hill, where St. Peter's Basilica now stands. Archaeological and historical studies, especially those conducted in the 20th century, support this belief. Excavations carried out under St. Peter's Basilica in the 1940s revealed a necropolis dating back to Roman times. In this area, a tomb was discovered that many scholars believe to be that of Peter. The tomb contained bones that after forensic examinations were identified as those of a robust man in his 60s, corresponding to the known information about Peter. The Catholic Church considers the Pope as the successor of Peter, who is regarded as the first bishop of Rome. Leaders of all Christian denominations agree that God significantly used Peter to build and shape the Church of Christ. Peter's life, which began as that of a humble fisherman and became a foundational apostle in Christianity, exemplifies transformation, faith leadership and redemption. The letters attributed to Peter have been an essential part of Christian doctrine and ethics, and his leadership and martyrdom have been a source of inspiration for generations of Christians. The production of this video required a detailed analysis of various sections of the Bible. However, we acknowledge that we are not perfect, and if there is any error, we kindly ask for your fraternal correction. Please continue to support this work by subscribing to our channel and liking this video. May God bless you. Amen.